what you don't do is make it easier. Treat everybody to free <laughs> marshmallows. And this is not about being soft. In fact, it's the opposite. It's about making big promises and keeping them. It's about establishing a road into the future. And that's what excites people, is that they made a difference. That the world probably has enough sunglasses. What the world doesn't have is enough meaning. And the way we get meaning is by making a change happen. And that change doesn't have to be on a global scale. It could be changing one customer, changing one supplier, changing the way one family interacts. But if people are at work with agency, treated with respect, making change happen, that's the kind of work we do voluntarily. Getting paid is a byproduct of that. It's not the point. Welcome to the Culture Gooder Podcast with Stephen Lees and Sean Tinney. This podcast is a behind-the-shades look at creating and changing culture inside of Gooder Sunglasses. You can live with the status quo, you can challenge the status quo, or you can do what we do at Gooder and status the quo challenge. We have a very special guest with us today, host of the Akimbo Podcast, thought leader, author of multiple New York Times bestsellers, including my favorite book, Your Turn, Seth Godin. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And as we're sitting here uh, warming up, I was thinking, do flamingos make a noise? Like what? what Ooh. Like dogs make a barking sound. What do flamingos do? It's like a squawk. It, it, we call it a squawk, but it's like a squawk. It's a like almost like a honk and a squawk together when you hear it. How mellifluous. Okay. <laughs> uh, Seth, this is the Culture Gooder podcast. So I'd love to know what does what does culture mean to you in, in the context of the workplace. Uh, I define culture as the way things are around here. People like us do things like this, and culture in an organization defeats strategy every time that we can find organizations that had a great strategy, but if the culture didn't support a thousand little decisions every day, they fell apart. And we destroy the culture when we make a compromise for profit. So when there's a sales rep who's a bully and we don't take action because, Oh, they're getting their numbers. Well, you've just sent a message to every single person in the organization. What are things like around here? That's what culture is. Oh, I love that. Uh, I uh, I think we've talked a lot, of, a lot around here about how do we evolve our culture appropriately as we as we grow, and how do we become self governing? Uh, mm -hmm. Be so that because one person can't control it. That's right. One person can certainly influence the culture, and a key part of my new book is about commitments we get to make to each other. Things about criticize the work, not the worker. Make promises and keep them. Figure out how to create a culture of forward motion and failure in the service of learning as opposed to hoarding information just because we're worried we're going to get in trouble. There's lots of choices we get to make in a culture and we can build it on purpose if we want. It's not an accident. Well, on that note, I mean, if we talk about your new books, you have, it's coming out uh, May 30th, I believe, The Song of Significance. I uh, can't wait to read it. So, I mean, tell us about the new book. Tell us about, about it. Uh, the, the title is A Song of Significance. The uh, subtitle is A New Manifesto for Teams. So why did you write it? So it's a different world than it was 10 years ago, even five years ago. Uh, we all survived, if we're still around, a worldwide pandemic. We lost loved ones. Uh, we saw AI show up and replace the mediocre work of millions of people. If you're a mediocre writer or a mediocre photographer or a mediocre illustrator, I can get a computer to do it for free, faster than you. Um, we saw billionaires brutalizing their employees, firing them in public, treating people with disrespect. And we have this new world we're entering into where we're not going to be able to make it cheaper and faster. Cheaper and faster is done. It took 100 years to get to the point where we can't make it cheaper or faster, but we can't. Yeah. What we can do is make a difference. And what we do at work is make decisions. That most of the people who are listening to this don't use a pickaxe or a punch press at work. What they use at work are their fingertips. And what they own is the means of production. The laptop you have is the same laptop that the CEO of the biggest company in the world has. There's no difference. And so if you've got access to this whole world and your job is to make decisions, well then... What's keeping us from making this the best job you ever had? And 
that is what motivated me to show up and shine a light on what I think is a fork in the road. And I'm just frustrated at how many people are willing to burn down the planet, race to the bottom, all in the name of convenience or profit. So what is the song of increase and why do we need significance? Uh, I'm, I'm curious here. So uh, Jacqueline Freeman is a feral beekeeper. She's not feral. The bees are feral. And <laughs> what she wrote about is that at the end of a long winter, the bees may have survived the winter. The purpose of the honey is not to make the beekeeper happy. The honey is there as a reserve. So the bees have something to eat when it's cold out. And in that moment, they may decide that the hive is in good enough shape that they can swarm. And what will happen in less than a 10 minute window is 15,000 bees will leave the hive. They will leave behind all the honey, all the baby bees, a baby queen. They will just leave. She calls this the song of increase, the leap into a possible tomorrow. And when they get to the tree 100 feet away, they will form a tight ball because they're very vulnerable. They only have three days to find a new place to live. If they don't, if it rains, if there's some disruption, they're all going to die. And in that moment, they're forming and singing the song of safety because they don't want anything bad to happen. And when I heard of these two songs, I named the second one, I realized that we are all living a song of safety right now. That we've been so traumatized by so many things that everyone's hunkering down, tired of being manipulated, tired of wasting time in Zoom calls. And we're not bees, but we can do better than that. And so the song of significance, which is what happens at the best job you ever had? Well, what happens is you're treated with respect. You do more than you thought you could. You're proud of the work you do. That's available to us, and we're wasting it. So I wanted to outline what are the questions we can ask each other, and how do we create an environment where we are doing work that matters with people who care? So, I mean, as a leader of a company, what do I do to create a culture where everybody here feels like... uh, you know, they have the best job they ever had. Well, what you don't do is make it easier. Treat everybody to <laughs> free marshmallows. And it's not about being soft. In fact, it's the opposite. It's about making big promises and keeping them. It's about establishing a road into the future. And that's what excites people, is that they made a difference. That... The world probably has enough sunglasses. What the world doesn't have is enough meaning. And the way we get meaning is by making a change happen. And that change doesn't have to be on a global scale. It could be changing one customer, changing one supplier, changing the way one family interacts. But if people are at work with agency, treated with respect, making change happen, that's the kind of work we do voluntarily. Getting paid is a byproduct of that. It's not the point. So as the CEO, the question I would ask is, how much time is your team spending in Zoom calls listening to you talk? Because you should just cancel those meetings. There's no point to that. (laughs) That if we're taking attendance when people are working in a distributed manner, we're not trusting them. If we are using false proxies to decide what's important, easily measured things that aren't relevant to the change we seek to make, we have taken a lazy path. We have to measure the right things and ignore the wrong ones. And so much of the challenge that we have in our culture is that we hire people who look like us, we promote people who we like to hang out with, when in fact, that's not why we're here. And humans aren't a resource. Humans are the point. So is the goal to... uh, I think a lot of uh, my role is to... It is to challenge people, is to uh, create inspiration points, keep going direction, and challenge them. And the people who want to be challenged, awesome. And the people who don't end up, they go another way. Is that do you do you feel the same way? Yeah. No, I think enrollment is critical. That yeah, uh, you are creating the conditions for significance, and you are driving a bus that's going to Toledo. And if there are people on the bus who want to go to Cleveland, they should get off the bus. Turnover is not a bad thing. Turnover is a good thing. 
because new hires can catch up now with Slack and the other tools we've got in one day, not in three months, that if someone is eager to go where you're going and to have the kind of interactions that fill the rest of the team with significance, they should join you. But if they don't, if their, if their mission is to do less, not to do more, then there's no reason for them to stay. We don't get tomorrow over again. And they shouldn't go to work at a place that doesn't light them up. Oh, I love that. So the audience of this podcast is entrepreneurs, teams, and brand leaders, people who want to create change in their culture. So how would you recommend they use this book to create change? Is it inspiration point? Is it tactical? So you and I were talking about your new book and about what it is to make it a book. If I wrote a blog post, I would reach 10 times as many people. So what's the point mm-hmm. of a book? A book is a totem. It is a, a thing we can touch. It is a thing we can share. And if you hand this to your coworkers or your boss or your employees and say, let's talk about this on Monday, you've opened the door for let's get real or let's not play. Let's find out what we are doing around here. If your boss says, look, my boss just wants us to hit the quarterly numbers and all I want you to do is what I tell you to do. I'm a manager. Well, at least they're telling you the truth. And now you can stay or you can go. But these mutual commitments are critical if we're going to build something that matters. And there are lots of endeavors in the world where this is normal, right? It's normal for a high-performing NBA team to have these conversations about what it's like around here, what it's like on the court, what it's like at practice. Well, we can bring that thinking to work as well. So you you mentioned managers. I want to get your thoughts on this. We kind of have a a good, we have leaders, not managers. And that's something that really we do a lot of work on. Uh, I think it's easy for people to want to be a manager and say, uh, do what I say. And so how we define the difference and and I want your opinion on is, Managers give orders, leaders ask questions, managers have subordinates, leaders have followers, managers hold authority, leaders are motivational, managers tell you what, leaders show you how, managers have good ideas, leaders inspire good ideas, managers react to change, leaders create change, managers want power over, leaders give power to, managers avoid tough conversations, leaders lean into them, Uh, managers don't exist at Gooder, but leaders do. What are what are your thoughts? Uh, and then I'd love to know, you know, the commitments bosses need to make and what commitments workers need to make in return. That's a brilliant riff, and I hope it's in your new book. It's really good. Um, you probably need some managers, too. It's <laughs> very difficult for an organization that still needs to do what it did yesterday to not have any managers at all. The bus needs to run on time. Airlines have nothing but managers, right? That when uh, the internet showed up, Simon & Schuster, Random House, the rest of the book publishing world didn't do anything on the internet because they weren't in the change business. They were in the business of chopping down trees. And so that's why they didn't start Google, even though they had everything they needed to start Google. Uh, In the case of your company, there are things that need to be managed. There are processes where we're not looking for the future. We're just shipping the stuff. But you are absolutely correct in the way you're describing it. And so then when we think about the culture, what gets you fired at a company with managers is you did not obey. That's what gets you in trouble. You didn't hit your numbers or you broke a rule. So what gets you in trouble in an organization of leaders? And this is where we get into trouble because it seems to me that what should get you in trouble is you didn't make any mistakes, you didn't take responsibility, and you didn't describe a future and then do everything you could to build an organization that could reach it. If you are indoctrinated by 15 or 20 years of school, brainwashed into thinking that your job is to do your job, to ask, will this be on the test, then... We're not going to be able to unbrainwash you right away, but we can change what the test is. And when I was running Yoyodyne, one of the first internet companies, I had three senior managers, leaders, and I said to David, one of them, I said, you know, you haven't made a significant mistake in six weeks. And he was like, yeah, isn't that great? I said, 
if you don't make a significant mistake in the next month, I'm going to fire you in front of everybody. Because if we don't establish that culture, no one's going to make a mistake. And that means no one's going to try something new. And it's that mindset shift that says the only way to explore is to find all the things that don't work on your way to finding the thing that does work. That is what it means to go into the liminal space between here and there. Uh, we've talked about this before, but on the podcast, we have an award at Gooder called the Flock Up of the Year. And it goes to the team who played the biggest and, and, and failed the biggest. Uh, so want to hear your thoughts on that, but also the difference between uh, making a mistake and making a poor choice. Because I, sometimes I think, uh, you know, we celebrate failure here, but there is a difference. Oh, there's no question about it. And Annie Duke, former world poker champion, has written a couple great books about this. So uh, let me take you through her, uh, her thought process. The, uh, I'm not a football fan, so I'm going to get part of this wrong. The, the Seattle football team is in the Super Bowl, and they're on the three-yard line. They have time for two plays. Pete Carroll um, calls a pass. It doesn't get caught, and they lose the game. Question, did Pete Carroll make a bad decision? And the answer is, no, he didn't. There was a bad outcome. He made a good decision, because if you look at the statistics of this play against a team like this in a thousand situations, you should call a pass. That is the right decision, but he had a bad outcome. And when we start connecting decisions to outcomes, we get very confused. Because we're becoming attached to the future, not present with what is right in front of us. So when you're talking about building the institution that you're building, you know, you, Stephen, are one of a kind and you know it. You can do this intuitively. But there are people who work for you who need structure and guidance so that they can feel confident enough to make good decisions even when they don't lead to good outcomes and to report back to the team what they did, how the decision was made, why it was a good decision, and what they're going to do now that the outcome didn't work. It's that cycle of revision. That's what Satya Nadell is doing at, um, at Microsoft, right? That when Steve Ballmer was in charge, he was the worst CEO, except for one CEO <laughs> I can name now, the worst CEO in memory because he's missed four of the four biggest breakthroughs in technology because he needed to be right. And so it was easy for him to get publicity saying that the iPhone was a stupid idea, right? Easy for him to point out that he didn't think that search engines were going to matter very much. Whereas the mindset of leadership is, we're not sure what's going to happen to this AI thing, but the cost of turning over the next card isn't that high. Let's try it. And that is how you deal with a status quo that's always changing. All right. So we're all about uh, uh, challenging the status quo here. What you just mentioned AI, I'm kind of curious. Uh, Leader of a company, how should I be approaching AI with the team right now? Well, I think what, um, because I don't do any consulting, I can say anything I want. But I I guess what I would ask is, (laughs) what is the change your company seeks to make? Right? Like Starbucks said their change was to help pre-caffeinated people become caffeinated. And then once they have got pretty good at that, the change they thought to make was to help their uh, workers build a better life with health benefits and everything else. And then once they got good at that, their change was to build a place that's not work and it's not a bar where you can meet your friends. Those are the changes they seek to make. So what is the change Gooder seeks to make? For our, for our team, I want everybody to celebrate the work of results. I want everybody to show up every day, love what they do, and be fulfilled by the work above everything. So that's, that's the internal change that we seek to make. And do you have a useful way for that to get measured? Is it up to you or is it up to them? Oh, it's got to be up to them, right? Well, it depends. Because as you're enrolling people in the journey, you have a challenge because different people want different things, but they're working in teams, right? So Mm -hmm. uh, 
the late Tony Shea was famous for what happened after you joined uh, Zappos and had been trained for three weeks. If you weren't any good, if you didn't fit in, you were let go. If you were good, if you were the kind of person they wanted on their customer service desk, they called you into a room and they handed you $3,000 in cash. And they said, if you quit today, you can have $3,000. Because his thesis was someone who would quit for $3,000 isn't the kind of person that he wanted to work with. And so you ended up with people who understood after three weeks what things were like around here. What does a good day on the phones look like, right? And that culture is having trouble outlasting living longer than he did because it's very difficult to maintain because entropy shows up and starts to wear it away. So when we think about building a culture of a team of dozens or hundreds of people, we've got to just keep going back to what are things like around here? Who are we elevating as the hero? Why is this person a hero today? What stories do we tell? So at the beginning of FedEx, a true story, uh, a FedEx driver used the company credit card to charter a helicopter to get over a snow-covered pass to deliver one $20 package. And at the beginning, by amplifying that, you were sending a message to all the workers at FedEx about what was important. Now they'd fire you in a heartbeat. They don't want anybody to think for themselves because they're just <laughs> they're just cranking it up. At Nordstrom, guy walks into a Nordstrom store with a snow tire. He walks up to the counter where they sell ties and he puts the snow tire on the glass counter. And he says, I bought the snow tire here. I don't need it anymore. I'd like a refund. And the Nordstrom's sales rep reaches into the cash register, hands him $300 and says, sorry, it didn't work out. And Nordstrom doesn't sell snow tires. The reason they made that story into a legend was because this was the Nordstrom's in Anchorage, Alaska, and it used to be a Sears. And so a year ago, that counter had, in fact, been selling mm -hmm. snow tires. You spread that story because what you're establishing for the people who work for you is a level of agency and authority that most organizations can't do. So it's not about giving $300 to every customer who asks for it. It's about deciding how are you going to build signifiers into the culture so that people align on your vision of what a good day is like around here. Because you can't say to everyone, you pick what a good day is like around here because you will not be mm -hmm. able to produce the value you seek. Ooh. <clears throat> I mean, this is a tough problem I get to solve now. So I, 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 uh, uh uh, appreciate that. So earlier you were talking about meetings. Uh, I'd love to kind of go on this a little bit more. A gooder, we recognized a while ago, meetings were becoming a problem. You know, any small company gets bigger and bigger, then people are sitting in more meetings. And so one thing we did is there's no meetings allowed before 2 p.m. on Monday, uh, no meetings on Wednesdays, and no meetings on Fridays so that people have time to do the work. Would love to know your thoughts on that and then just meetings in general at companies. Well, that's bold. Good for you. Um, that's a strong CEO move. My friend Toby uh, had 10,000 employees. He wrote a script that went in and canceled every recurring Google meeting on every single person's time. <laughs> and then he sent a note to the whole company saying, I just gave you back 20 hours a week. You can put the calendar meeting back on your calendar if you insist, but let's start over. Um, What's a meeting? A meeting is not a conversation. Conversations, as you and I are having, never mm -hmm. hurt anybody. Conversations are a good thing. A meeting is when one person is taking the time of other people to announce stuff and be sure that the other people heard them. So we built the Carbon Almanac with 300 volunteers in 40 countries, and we had not one meeting, not one, for the entire team. Instead, wow. if I had something to say, I recorded my four minutes, I edited it, I made sure I wasn't wasting anybody's time, and then I would send what I had to say to people to watch, sped up if they wanted, at their own time when they wanted, and then we could have a conversation if it was relevant to you, right? That Automatic, which Matt Mullenweg runs, which powers 40% of the internet, they don't have very many meetings because they have a reading and writing culture. If you have something that needs to happen, you write a post about it and other people comment on your post and back and forth and back and forth. 
there's a trail behind, there's fewer status roles at play, and better work incrementally gets done. So we got lazy when we started calling meetings. It's easier to just sit in a room and make stuff up as you go along and see if people are smiling than it is to (laughs) use your time to think it through. And it also puts us on the hook. Because if you say to the team, we're not going to do a stand-up meeting where every person says one sentence that everyone's going to forget, but that you actually have to write out what's going to happen this week because of you. Tell us what it's going to be. Claim it. Write it down. And then next week, tell us whether it happened or not. And if you're not making big enough promises, we're going to tell you you're not making big enough promises. And if your promises are too big and they're not coming true, we're going to help you fix that problem. But we have wasted the magic that could be with Zoom, with breakout rooms, with asynchronous, with getting clear with the change we seek to make. And instead, many bosses, I'm not saying you, are using it to take attendance. And they're saying, oh, I got 18 people here. I know none of them are getting their dry cleaning. Everyone is, quote, at work. Not for me. Uh, Last year, around this time last year, I kind of stumbled upon Loom, which for our listeners who don't know, Loom is I can just on my lap on my laptop record a video, put it in our Slack threads, and it profoundly changed my ability to give feedback in a more clear, concise way, where I don't need people in a room. Um, that I'm actually obsessed with. Uh, I mean, it feels like more people should be using this tool. The reason we don't is we don't want to be on the hook, knowing we're being recorded, makes us shy away a little bit. It increases our obligation just the way a memo does because you know it could leak out into the world. And so it's easier to just like ixnay on that. But we're doing something important here. So claim it. And if you're not willing to write it down or record it, don't say it. Let's be very clear and intentional about the feedback loop, the culture. We're criticizing the work and raising our standards We are never criticizing the worker because Mm -hmm. the worker can change what they make, but the work is the work. Uh, Last thing on meetings that uh, I I haven't written a script. Uh, I don't know how to write a script to cancel reoccurring meetings, but we do have four weeks a year, one basically at every quarter. That is a no meeting week, so no no meetings are allowed. And the best practice is to cancel, go through and audit every meeting you have and decide whether or not you want to carry it forward. I love that. Well done. Probably uh, a little, probably awesome. a little more gentle than just canceling everybody's meetings. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I, I'm, I'm kind of jealous of that because that is a, a that's a baller <laughs> move. Uh, all right, so I might get this pronunciation wrong, but I want to know uh, what is Kokoro. I, I called um, some uh, Japanese cultural organizations, and they said Kokoro. Um, Kokoro. Kokoro is in a Chinese ideogram adopted in Japanese of a house with a heart in it. And the argument is that when we aren't simply a cog in an industrial process, but when we can bring our heart to the change that we are making, it makes us feel alive. And that's true for just about everybody. Someone volunteers at a local animal shelter, not for the money, not for the free dog biscuits, but because this work makes them feel alive. But it turns out you can have that feeling regardless of what you make. There are people who work at pharmaceutical companies saving lives, and there are people who are street sweepers. All of them are capable, if the conditions are right, of finding heart at work. And we're talking about 90,000 hours of your life, a life that's really fragile. And it's hard for me to see why somebody who has the skills to do work that could be like that would resist the opportunity to do so. Mm. How would you go about coaching somebody into, or having somebody ask questions of, you know, uh, um, are they, you know, do they have the heart in their work? Are they finding it? Well, again, people have been brainwashed for 12 or 20 years. They have had their hearts broken. They have been double crossed. They are surrounded by bosses. You know, I'm doing a talk at Harvard in a couple of weeks, and they said, uh, write down what you're going to talk about, which annoyed me. And then they (laughs) edited it from how to create the conditions for significance to 
how to get your people to feel like they're significant, which is a totally different thing. That's like, how do we trick people by putting out fancy snacks? <laughs> and then we can go back to, to bossing folks around. When you say to somebody, I trust you to lead this, they don't believe that you trust them. When you say to somebody, I've got your back, they don't believe you've got their back because they've seen this movie before, particularly people from communities that traditionally haven't been in the dominant caste, that it's very easy to be skeptical of this. And so for me, I think it's what's the smallest possible unit of significance. Can I create a job, the conditions and opportunity for someone for three minutes to do something that lights them up for three minutes where responsibility is taken? Because if you can do it for three minutes, just in a very small way, you might want to do it again and then again and again. And I was super lucky at my first job. My bosses trusted me and I didn't know better than to be skeptical. Sorry, that's the local <laughs> fire department. I didn't know better to be skeptical. And it worked out. Like I did stuff that cost the company a lot of money. And I did enough things that made people happy that I got to keep playing. And when we think about how fast the cycles are going now, companies that used to have 25 years at top now get two years on top. If the cycles are really going that fast and they're going to go faster, I think we have to get comfortable with this cycle of saying creating a culture of significance is more important than maximizing our profit this week. Agreed. Uh, All right. Last question, Seth. What's one status quo you think we need to challenge inside uh, American companies today? If you've ever had Ben and Jerry's brownie ice cream, have you, they make a dairy free version. (laughs) No, I've had a bunch, but not that one. Ben and Jerry's is the number one ice cream in America, which I did not know. Um, Their brownies are all made at the Grayston Bakery, which is two miles from here. And the Grayston Bakery is an offshoot of Bernie Glassman's spiritual institution. And they have pioneered something called open hiring. And the way you get a job at Grayston is you go there and they write your name down on a clipboard. And if someone leaves, the next person on the list gets the job. Doesn't matter if you're previously incarcerated. Doesn't matter if you have drug issues in your past. It doesn't matter what you look like or what kind of accent you have. The next person on the list gets the job. And when you get there, there's intensive training and support. And many of the people, for whatever reasons, have so much trauma in their life, they just can't do the the work. But if you can do the work, you can stay. And the Body Shop adopted this open hiring at all their retail stores. When they did, turnover went down 60%. And productivity went up 15% within weeks, and stayed that way. Why doesn't every company have open hiring? And the reason is, deep down, we're still managers. Deep down, we think we have good taste. We know who to pick. We say, oh, no, 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 I couldn't possibly give up who gets to walk in this door and be part of the team. I need to interview them for two hours first. Well, yeah, but now you're also using misogyny and racism and fear of the other to make sure that the people around here are the kind of people you're looking for. So there are some jobs where you can't have open hiring. I don't want surgeons to have open hiring. Thank you very much. (laughs) But for many of the jobs that are entry level, for many of the jobs where the skills can be learned in a short period of time, we have a chance to dramatically shift how our organizations work. And the PS is we'll make more money doing it. The PS is we will grow faster doing it. But that's not the reason. The thing about the honey and the hives is the purpose of a beehive isn't to make honey. The honey is a byproduct of a healthy hive. And too many of our organizations aren't healthy. And demanding more honey is not the way to get them to be healthy. Well, uh, we will end on that, Seth. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. It's been a real honor. Uh, uh, very grateful for your time and all the work you uh, put out in the world. Thank you. Keep making this ruckus. And uh, I hope that other people start to learn from you. It matters. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Culture Gooder podcast. To submit questions for the podcast, learn more about our culture, and learn how you can status the quote challenge, head over to gooder.com slash culture. 
And don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you're listening, including on YouTube, where you can now watch all of our new episodes. Who knows? You might even catch a glimpse of Carl at our headquarters if he's not already passed out at the tiki bar from all the margaritas. 